which is better, pazopinib or sunitinib? There was a big study called COMPAS that asked that very question, where patients were randomised to receive either sunitinib or pazopinib. And essentially what we found from the results was that there was no difference in terms of progression, response or overall survival. It was exactly the same. However, we know that TKIs are not without their own spectrum of side effects, examples of which include mucositis, hand and foot syndrome, and rash. So, which is better, pazopinib or sunitinib? So, we ran a study called Pisces, which asked that very question. So, Pisces was a study that basically looked at the comparing of the side effects of both pazopinib to sunitinib. Patients were randomised in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive either pazopinib in the first instance or sunitinib in the first instance, following which they were then crossed over and had the other drug that they hadn't gotten in the first place. They were then asked in the form of questionnaires um, to see which drug they preferred. Now, it's really important to stress that in this study, it was a double-blinded study, so patients didn't know which drug they were receiving to begin with, and neither did the clinicians. And it was really interesting to see that from the results that significantly more patients preferred pazopinib over sunitinib. When asked the reason for this, there was no specific reason actually given. Patients just said they felt generally better, um, though they did say that fatigue and hand and foot syndrome was marginally better on the pazopinib. Um, there were, however, issues raised with the study. Um, for example, um, the strengths um, that were mentioned was that it was double-blinded and the fact that two weekly questionnaires were given. However, there were criticisms of the study, as there always are with clinical studies, um, the first of which was that um, patients were only followed up for two cycles, thereby raising the question whether or not patients were followed up for a long enough period of time. And the second issue um, was the fact that obviously pazopinib is given continuously, whereas um, sunitinib, you have a four-week on, two-week off period, so it's an intermittent um, regime. Um, so in the second line setting, as mentioned earlier, we've got excitinib and avrolimus. Um, so AXIS was the big study which compared excitinib to serafinib um, in patients who had sunitinib refractory disease. So patients randomised to receive either excitinib or serafinib, and the reason that serafinib was chosen as a drug is because it was the most widely used drug in the US at that point in time. Um, the outcome measure that was used was progression-free survival. And as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier curve, there was a statistically significant difference in progression-free survival in the excitinib arm compared to the serafinib arm. Um, the side effects were similar though there was probably more hand and foot syndrome in the serafinib arm and more diarrhoea in the excitinib arm. Moving on to the mTOR inhibitors, which, as we've mentioned earlier, have a more indirect um, way of targeting VEGF. Record 1 was the study that looked at Avrolimus versus placebo um, in VEGF refractory disease, so patients were randomised to receive either um, Everlimus or placebo, with again the outcome measure being progression-free survival. And as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier curve, there was clearly a significant difference in progression-free survival favouring Everlimus over placebo. The main side effects um, with Everlimus tend to be stomatitis, um, you can get a rash as well associated, and you also get diarrhoea. So in summary, we know that pazopinib and sunitinib are both effective oral long-term therapies that we use in the first-line setting. Um, from COMPAS, we know there is no difference in um, efficacy between the two drugs. And it does, I think, very much boil down to clinical experience when deciding which drug to use. Um, though from our Pisces study, it did seem to show that patients tended to prefer pazopinib over sunitinib. Um, in our second line setting of excitinib and everolimus, again both long-term oral therapies, again no proven efficacy uh, difference between the two, but I have to have a pause and mention here that that has never been a head-to-head -head study that's compared that. Um, again, I think it does boil down to clinical experience. 
in terms of deciding which drug to use. So with all the variety of drugs available to us, you'd think that we would be able to answer the question as to know which patient would benefit from which drug. And unfortunately, we still don't know the answer to this. This diagram essentially shows chromosomal studies that we've tried to carry out to pick which cancer type might respond to which therapy. Um, but as you can see, each tumour tends to have different and multiple clones, which means that the protein expression, depending on which area of the cancer you look at, is completely different. So you could biopsy, say, one area, and the protein expression in that area would be completely different from an area that you biopsied just next to it. So we've spoken a lot about the different therapies in renal cancer today. Um, so in summary, we know that there are a lot of systemic therapies currently available in the treatment of metastatic renal cancer. Um, immune therapy is an area that is rapidly expanding and I think is going to be very exciting in terms of what it shows in the next couple of months and years to come. Um, we are very fortunate in the UK to have a lot of drugs available to us via the Cancer Drugs Fund. And certainly I think in deciding which drugs um, to give to which patient, I think it does very much boil down to clinical experience. And unfortunately at present, we're still not able to select patients um, based on what therapy might be best for them in terms of the fact that we don't actually have any biomarkers available at present. Mm -hmm.